friends. We are in summer and I thought it is the perfect time or it's the perfect evening, I should say, to do a summer garden tour. You know, previous years, I don't always do a summer garden tour. And do you know why? Our summers can be erratic. Obviously, they're usually hot and humid, but more so the last few years, they've been extremely dry. And while we are still in a drought this year in Southeast Iowa, where I live, we this year have gotten just recently a few inches of rain. And as you can see, it has greened everything up. So things are looking a little bit more vibrant right now. And the weather is beautiful. We have some cooler nights and days for a while. And it's so fun to be able to go out and see everything. Also, somehow there are not too many cars going by on the road right now. So it's even kind of quiet. It's the perfect time to go around and show you everything. And I'm really excited with how some things turned out this year. I really love how some things are starting to get the rain they need to be able to grow a little bit better. Because let's just, we all know it. When it rains, things are more happy than if we just water them. It's a better, more nourishing water. It saturates more evenly. So let's go around and take a little bit of a tour. We're going to start right at the front walkway. We have a uh, stripey here welcoming us. That's stripey kitty. She's been here for quite a while. And um, this is the front where everyone will come in. So it's just like you're being welcomed to the house. So right here, I've always had this big limestone, heavy carved architectural salvage piece. And I think it looks like a cornerstone. And I like to put some version of an agave on top of it. This year, all of the stockies or lamb's ear, these are all Helen von Stein variety. They have really started filling in. And what I love is they're making a beautiful big ring all around the front flower bed. So as soon as you drive in the driveway, which is right up here, you are welcomed with this big sea of silvery white green foliage. And I really love that. And it really is offset by all the boxwood. I have flags beside some of them because when I was on vacation, I had someone water. And that was just a way to make sure I marked the things that need to be watered. So if you see flags, that is why. But you can see what I want to do is have all these boxes that eventually get quite large. I want them to grow into each other and really be various sizes, kind of like a cloud effect. But this whole area is really lush this year. It's really feeling, filling in well. The red leafed mucadinia, as you can see, I love the foliage. It blooms in the spring, but then it gets this tinge of red on it throughout the summer. It's just a nice contrast. The hellebores or Linton rose are really starting. They've been there for a few years now. And they're really starting to fill in. You can see I started shaping up some of the boxwood. So you see little bits and pieces. On beds where it fills in quite a bit, like these perennials and boxwood are, I let the boxwood go down and it eventually just mulches or compost back in. I do have Sun King Aurelia around the urn here because it just adds a nice pop of green. And I think that's really important to have some contrast of color and texture. This is an area that is actually more and more shaded from a massive pin oak that has been here since probably around 1970. If I look back at old pictures, it's either in the 60s or the 70s that this was planted. So it's a huge tree that is really starting to shade in this area, but I still love how the area is looking. So I think we should go up to the front flower beds because I wanna show how things look up there. So in these front flower beds, if you look at my spring tour, you're going to see that it was a sea of color with the cat's pajamas, cat mint, and the beautiful silvery foliage of the Russian sage. But now we've kind of mixed. So we've changed and the Russian sage is now blooming that purple color. The cat mint I just recently cut back just a few days ago and look how quickly it's all starting to push out new growth. So all this will eventually start blooming again too, which is really nice. The Millennium Allium are just about to bloom. So there'll be another variation of purple. And I have some white cloud calumet mixed in back there too. So still a sea of color out front when you drive in. In general, I think it is really important to obviously have color that can try to go throughout the summer. It's not always possible, but as much as I can, I try to add things that will have a lot of color, but also things that are able to be somewhat drought tolerant, able to be eco-friendly, help pollinators. And so that's what that whole bed really does. When we walk up to the front porch, I've added in some more of the lambs ear all along the front. So eventually that will be a nice border along the front. I just have started trimming up some of these boxwood too. I have a mint julep palmed topiary here on the corner. I purchased this about 10 years ago and have been keeping it. So it all has somewhat of a nice shape. You know, I was nostalgic to it. My mom always had one growing up and she still has hers. It's about 30 years old now. So I still want to have one and that's why I have it on the corner. But um, here on the back has always been a hard spot. It either gets too hot along my cinder block front porch or things just don't like the south sun exposure. I've tried certain hydrangeas that like full sun like Bobo. 
I've tried little limelights and all of them eventually don't do well. So what I've switched to is Russian sage planted back there, which is just in its real first year. So eventually, hopefully, that will take off and be a nice large shrub behind all of these boxwood. And what I like about the boxwood is they stay green up here all year long. And these are a wintergreen variety, which is a little bit lighter in color, but I really like them. And this year, for the first time, I have just two ferns on each side of my front door. And I really like how simple it looks. It just is a really nice, iconic look. So we're going to be doing this tour right now. It's about sunset. We're getting into the evening. So you get a lot of that golden sun that's coming through. And it's really drawing us into my new pathway, which you've heard me talk a lot about this year. This pathway is really an idea I've had for a long time. And what held me back for years on even trying to do it was I have a lot more I want it to be. So I want the pathway to completely keep going and extend all the way up to the house and out to the garden in both directions. And I always was held back because I couldn't, I didn't feel like I could ever do it all at once. And so that made me feel like I shouldn't do any of it. This year I decided, you know what? We can always do little bits and pieces and why not start by doing a small amount? So this is the beginning of the path and that's why it was a big deal for me to do this year. And it's really growing in a lot. So right now the path really just looks like it begins in the middle of the yard, but eventually there's a vision to keep it going. But the first part is more of a shade garden. So I just planted some beautiful epidemia. Um, what I like about this, it's really a dry shade ground cover. And so I want these three to really start setting in and doing that. I'm, I just planted them. There are some sub and substance hosta back here. I've done, of course, some Gotimba aurelia. It's like the Sun King, but gets larger. So all these areas have different plants that are going to work in those areas, thus why it starts with shade. But then when we switch over, it goes into a full sun area. So I have lots of Caradonna salvia. And then this whole area, if you saw the video, is all a grid of prairie drop seed grass. And you can see within just a month or two how it's really started taking off. And it's starting to put its plumes on already to its seed heads. But within all that grass, eventually, what's nice about this, obviously, it's an ornamental grass. I'm not going to be mowing it. I'm not going to be doing anything to it other than once a year, cutting it all down to the ground, along with some perennials that I've interspersed. We have pinstamen, dark towers. I have some baptisia of different colors. I have monarda, which the monarda right now has some powdery mildew just from our weather, which you can combat with neem oil if you want to. This year, I'm not going to worry about it. I'll probably just cut back the monarda now that it's bloomed and let some of the new growth come out that doesn't have powdery mildew. You can see the tops do, but it's its first year and I'm not surprised. It's something that bee balm can have. If you remember, both sides of the pathway are edged in a four by four inch limestone edging and it has just a three eighths contractor chip limestone in the center. So it's a really organic feel in the garden and that's what I like. As we come up to this corner, I have a weeping purple beech, which can be really wonky, unique and wild. And that's what I want as it grows. I'm gonna extend the bed on the other side probably next year but this year it's just really pretty. I have a millstone set into the corner of the path, which again, just kind of adds to the whimsy and it has a really organic feel. But then this side is what I am so excited to be able to show you. If you saw the video when I planted these things, it was early spring. Actually, no, it wasn't even that early. It was mid to like mid spring when I planted everything. It was in May. And just a few months later, all of these perennials have really begun to explode and fill in. So we have the heat of summer, we have, of course, I've been watering them or had them watered if I was gone. And then we had rain and everything has really just started to make all this grow. And what I want to remind you before I show close-ups is all of these perennials started with one gallon size containers. So all of them were about the same size when they started. A few of them were taller or shorter, but they all started as pretty small starts. And within just a couple months, this is the change that can happen. And that's the amazing thing about perennials. So the most showy ones right away is the Agastache in the back. And that is, I really love it. It's blue fortune variety. You can see how nice a form it has. Now it will naturalize in time and possibly take over more. And I'm okay with that. I really don't mind it filling in. I want this whole area to never need to be remulched. I want it just to be able to be self-containing. So every spring I will cut down all the perennials, mulch them into the bed, probably with a push mower, and they'll be happy. And so if you look down here, we have more Caradonna salvia, but what I did was I did groupings usually of three to five perennials. So it really showed an impact of color. So we have that white cloud calamint, we have Millennium allium, Caradonna salvia, we have Rudbeckia, 
just the very simple Herta variety. And then we kind of repeat all of those in various patterns going down the bed. In the back, there's Culver's root, which will take a few years to become a large clump. But when it does, it will stay very upright and it's much more sturdy. I also have clumps of Baptisia, which in time will fill in this whole space not only with the foliage, but with gorgeous spires of blooms in the spring. So for me, this is a real deviation from some of my other perennial beds. This one was much more planned out. I thought about this for a long time. I thought about the waves of color, the groupings of plants I wanted to have. So I'm really excited. You can see that Rudbeckia is just about to bloom. So it's, it's just super fun. And I think it's fun to kind of rethink and have different patterns, but all these perennials are really gonna be able to take care of themselves in years to come. A quick mow down every spring, and then just blooms all season long. Before I move on, I know I'm gonna get questions about the statues, which are busts, and they're not old. They look old because they're cast in antique molds, and they represent the four seasons. So there's four of them. I got them at a local garden center. But there's four of them and each one represents either spring, summer, fall, or winter. And I put them on limestone plinths, which I got off Facebook Marketplace actually for super cheap. So I just really like having elements in my garden that bring me joy, that make me happy, but also represent where you are. So the, the seasons to me is so fun to have out here because this bed I see from the house windows all four seasons and obviously it's going to change each season. So it's just kind of a nice reminder. We're moving into the backyard now. We're coming off the path. One thing I wanna show before we go to the backyard is a lot of you ask about my 18 limelight hydrangeas I put in two years ago as a hedge. Right now they're sitting behind a row of Woodward Arborvitae. These are just in their third year, but they're already in that three to four foot height range. And I cannot wait until they get eight foot plus. So eventually they will be taller than the Arborvitae. So they will be fully seen from the backyard and from the house and they'll just be this large beautiful hedge but then with this backdrop of the field and the sunsets beyond so this is my prairie i planted this spring with some trees in there too it's thriving right now the grasses are really filling in and i just really love how this is coming together so in my backyard we're going to first go over to the hydrangea that are really being showy right here in the middle of the yard this was planted about six years ago and i'm going to be honest this year i did not get any of the salvias cut down usually i cut them back and let them rebloom i didn't and you know what that's okay sometimes we get busy and they're just going to be but um in the middle here i have the bar harbor series seaside serenade hydrangeas i don't even know if they still grow these i like them they're supposed to be like a annabelle hydrangea the arborensis but they're more sturdy and stay slightly smaller and they stay more upright so we've had rain recently a hard rain and you can see they're still staying upright I do have these in full sun and the brunt of sun. So usually when we get a little dry, they have a lot more brown on them. This year they're looking pretty good with our cooler weather and some rain. We'll see how long that lasts. Uh, behind them, the Joe Pie Weed, it's the phantom variety, is popping up. I love Joe Pie Weed. I grew up with it and I think it's a gorgeous flower. So that's behind them. But this whole bed then has lots of different salvias the white it has purple caradonna it has some allium that haven't bloomed yet so we'll have blooms here really soon with some hookahs down there and it's kind of just one of my favorite little areas because i have my stone table here where i put all of my aloe and agave pups some cactus are in here and all of these just thrive within this space and a lot of times they'll even be blooming in the summer i mean if you don't see an aloe bloom hawathia bloom like this too they're just fun they just make you happy so behind this, we're gonna go right into what I call my fire pit garden. And it's really just kind of a simple, fun place to be. As we walk into the space, I do have to say, I haven't sat out here a ton this year just because, you know what I find as a gardener? A lot of my enjoyment in the garden is the doing, the making, the creating, the working in the garden. So by the time evening comes, I'm usually like ready to be in the house, but it's not a bad thing. It's just that I enjoy that process of being out in the garden so much that I don't always go make a fire in it. Usually I use this space more when we're starting to get closer to fall because I love those crisp nights with a fire. But what I wanna show you is some of the fruit I'm about to pick here on this patio. The hydrangeas within all the boxwood hedging are about to bloom. This boxwood hedging has taken a beating. Last year we were super dry, all winter we were dry, going into spring we've been dry. And 
I don't always get all this watered. I did set up a sprinkler finally, in the fire pit actually, to water this whole area, but the box would definitely have some areas that don't look as good and haven't filled in as well, just because of this dry weather. I had a lot of dead I cut out this spring, and they will fill in, but you know, that's the thing. Things need water, and I try to only water as needed. So out here I have things like my rosemary topiaries, which I need to trim up. You can see I shape this one usually once a year. I have my mint that I keep in containers and use for iced tea. I have some bay leaves. These are a bay leaf tree. I mean, it's just made into a topiary, but by the way, fresh bay leaves. If you think your bay leaves that are in your spice cabinet that are dried have no flavor, they don't. But fresh, fresh totally will. What I do have almost ready are my figs. So one of my prized things are two fig trees. They're fairly young still. I've had a few different ones over the years. Um, I think I have a Corky's Delight and then I have a Mission Fig. But you can see they are loaded right now. And I usually get one crop. Once in a while on certain years I will get two crops out of them if I can get them out of storage early enough. This year I brought these out in April. So they go into a dormant period during the winter. They stay just above freezing, usually around 40 degrees all winter long, and just go dormant. And then when I bring them out, they push out their leaves and they have all the beautiful fruit. The other one is sitting directly across. It needs to be staked a little bit better because it's a little wonky, but you can still see it has tons of fruit on it all over. That's the thing with figs. They're super easy. They take no work. It really does need a stake. It takes no work and you get these gorgeous figs. And this year you can see it's gonna be quite a few. So I might have enough to actually do something with if I'd want to. I can make some fig jam. I actually just like to kind of eat them all fresh too. So we'll see. I do have a citrus tree out here, but to be honest, citrus hate me. I keep it year to year and I do get a couple off it every year, but during the winter scale is such, it is such something that I fight. But then during the summer, they usually push out all these new leaves like you can see and look happy. So. I still try. If you're anything like me and you love to garden, you try things. They don't always work like citrus. I have yet to have one that gets massive. Like I see people that keep them and they get massive and huge and beautiful. Mine straggle along. I fertilize them. I do everything to them. But you know, during the winter, they really want a greenhouse and I just don't have that. So they struggle usually throughout the winter and that's just how they look. So we're coming up on the back of my, what I call garden shed. And this is where if you watched the last spring tour, it has, it's full of peonies that are blooming and lots of just spring color. Right now it's transitioning more into summer, meaning that the peonies are obviously over. But what we have now are alliums about to bloom. We have betony blooming, which I love betony. So I'm gonna show you. Now I just reworked this bed this spring. So a lot of the items are starting off as new. So they're really small, but in a couple years, they're gonna be really big. My above and beyond roses, I have two of them. They were blooming, obviously, in spring. They haven't pushed out a second set of blooms yet. They probably will. But the Japanese beetles, even though I do come out and either knock them off into soapy water or use neem, they do get ahead of me because you can see right here, right there are the Japanese beetles just doing their work. And they love roses, so it's one of the first things they go to. But coming on down, you can see lots of alliums are blooming. You can see that right here are some small betony. Eventually, these will be much taller. They're just, I really love how simple betony is. Humulo betony is super easy to keep. It blooms so easily, and it's just one of those happy plants. I have some calumet in here too. Pollinators love calumet. Anything that pollinators love, I really like to add to my garden. And right now, everything is at least looking lush, which makes me happy. I have some garden flocks that are just about to bloom. I try to pack this bed so full that weeds don't get a chance. I don't want weeds to have a chance. I don't like it. So hopefully it's so full, they just don't really get to. You can see here is some betony too. You know, eventually they all get super big and just have so many blooms and that's what's so fun about them. But behind here, we're gonna go on down right at sunset into vegetable garden, which is where we're gonna end. This time of year is, again, we're early summer, so it's a slight transition in the vegetable garden. Tomatoes are not ready yet. Peppers are just beginning, I'm able to pick some. But my garlic, I harvested, Oh, about, I don't know, the end of June probably. So it's been out for a little bit. But what we have is the summer produce beginning and that's when it gets really exciting. So these are all my peppers. A lot of them are hot peppers. I do hot peppers at my house and we do sweet peppers at mom's house. So these are gonna be lots of 
banana peppers because I like to make my hot pepper mustard. You can check my website for that recipe. But it's one of my favorite things to can. It is a tangy hot mustard that is just absolutely delicious. So I plant four plants of just these yellow hot banana peppers, Hungarian hot peppers or Hungarian hot wax pepper. And I do it just so I can can a lot of that. I also have lots of serranos here. I have lots of jalapenos. I have, of course, all of the, let's just, we just have to actually look at some of these to see what, oh, I'll do Anaheim, which is a really good one. We like to use that in salsa. And then I'll even do different kinds of jalapeno. I think I have some peach jalapeno right there. So all of these are gonna be used in usually canning hot peppers. I like to make pickled hot peppers but then in salsa and things like that. I have two tomatillo plants for when we make salsa and they're just beginning to start putting on some size. You can feel in the husks that they have a little bit of size. I always roast them first, just like you would for a salsa verde. And then I add them to my traditional salsa. My eggplants are a little slow this year, but they are coming. And you can see here, there's even right on here are some baby eggplant just beginning. So they will be here soon. I have about nine tomatoes always at my house. And at my house, I always do heirloom tomatoes that I either like to eat. A few of them I'll can, but mostly we do the canning tomatoes over at mom's because I'll plant about 12 Hungarian heart and Amish paste tomatoes at her house. Here I do a lot of different ones. I'll do Cherokee purple. I'll do green zebra. I'll do a pineapple striped tomato. I like to do all kinds and especially a sun sugar tomato if you have not done that. So it's like a sun gold but sun sugar is even sweeter and they get ready super early. So you can see it's already ripening. And guys, these are like candy. The sugar level is off the charts. So sweet. Sun gold is really good too, but sun sugar, prolific grower and so sweet. I have dealt, I talked about this in my newsletter. I've dealt a little bit with some leaf curl this year which every year I do somewhat, and I usually almost always know, and this year is no different, I get drift from area agricultural fields. So as much organic as I try to be, which is all I do, I still will get the drift from things around me that I can't control. So the leaf curl on my tomatoes, which you can see right here, if we zoom in, it's just like it starts curling. That's often a sign of stress, and it can be different things. It can be irregular watering, it can be excessive heat, but it also can be a drift where tomatoes are super sensitive. So they usually come out of it, it depends how bad it is, and they usually still produce their tomatoes, but it's something you have to deal with. Same with blossom and rot. I'm not dealing with that this year, but usually a lot of people feel that's a calcium deficiency or an inadequate ability to grab the calcium from the soil into the plant. I also find a lot of times it has to do with that irregular watering, either too much watering or too little, or not doing it at the right time. So all those things you just need to wash with tomatoes, but they are summer's favorite fruit. Behind the tomatoes, and I do rotate each bed each year, we have the cabbage, which I've been getting in, and I have the remnants of some of the ones that I've already gotten in. So you can see we have some empty spots. I still have a few more. This is Green Acre, I believe. Look, the cabbage this year is beautiful. I had row covers on it until the row covers were, it, the stuff was getting too big for them. So then I just use either some spinosad or some neem on them and that's been keeping them looking, I mean, look how beautiful they are. The big thing with cabbage, you wanna make sure you don't let it split. If it stays in the garden too long or takes on too much moisture when it's getting mature, it will split open. You can still eat it, you just wanna to try to avoid that. All of my broccoli here, you can see, I still have this head I have not harvested. I'm letting it grow just a stitch bigger. But what I do is I leave my plants all year, all year long and then I still come out. So like this, I harvested this broccoli probably a few weeks ago and now I come out every week and I have these florets of broccoli just to get in. So even though you harvest the main head, you'll still get florets of broccoli all throughout the season. I mean, look at that. That's just like beautiful. And then I don't have to buy it all summer long and that's what I really love. Down in here, I have some, I think it's cauliflower. Look at this cauliflower. So do you see what I did there? Usually I would tie this together. Even though cauliflower says self blanching, it isn't. And you don't, you, the reason you wanna cover cauliflower is it will turn yellow in the sun. I mean, look how gorgeous this cauliflower is, by the way. That's an absolutely beautiful head of cauliflower. If you just let it open like this to the sun, it will turn yellow, which will then cause it to sometimes get bitter or kind of tough tasting. 
So I always will just come out if I don't get it tied together and I break the leaves around it and no, this does not hurt it. And I just cover it with those broken leaves and then you don't have to worry about it. But I have a few more of those to get in. I believe I planted all the cauliflower at my house. Homegrown cauliflower, it's super tender, it's super sweet. It's one of my favorites. I hope you enjoyed the garden tour. You know, it's always fun to see it at different times of year. And I think I'm someone that, even for me, I always see all the issues with a garden. I see the issues with my garden and I always think I don't wanna show people. But I think it's important for us to remember that we see a lot more issues than other people do. And I've been talking to a lot of friends about that this year, how we can be hard on ourselves. That does not mean that other people don't appreciate it because it's always a work in progress. A garden is never perfect. I do do this all on my own. I do mine and I do my mom's mostly. And mom does a lot over there too, but I don't have help. And so there's always gonna be things that could be done better or be done quicker, but we still are able to get it done. And that's the fun part. The garden's always evolving and changing. And I think it's great to check in. So I hope you enjoyed it. As always, share this video around if you did enjoy it. Of course, that helps me, but I hope it helps others to see this is possible. It's possible to just get out there and start working and making changes in your yard, even if it seems impossible. Check my website, wiseguy.com, for recipes on how I use all my produce. It's all on the website. Until then, I, of course, have more gardening to do.